So thereby we can reach efficiencies that are even higher than the 83% you get off the shelf. And we have a credible pathway and technical solutions to bring that way above 90% efficiency. Yes, uh, my name is Jan Schmidt. I'm the Chief Technology Officer in TESS, so in charge of the overall technology strategy, selecting the right uh, suppliers and, and the right technology blocks to set up our TESS business model, is, which is all around ENG. So uh, we're going to learn a bit about that in the next few minutes. Yes, if you burn regular methane, you have basically already emitted a lot of greenhouse gas along the value chain before you get the molecule to your customer. And then when it's when it's burned there, it creates more CO2. So that's the overall emission profile of natural gas. Uh, on the contrary, if you look at electric natural gas, ENG, that TESS is producing, first of all, we don't have all these emissions in the upstream because we are producing it from green hydrogen made from renewable electricity combined with climate neutral CO2. And that's the key word. It's climate neutral CO2. So you're assembling the molecule based on climate neutral CO2 that is either biogenic or direct air captured or circular CO2. And then when you give this molecule, this substitute for natural gas to your client and the client uses it, if he burns it, there's two options. One is he burns it and releases the CO2 to atmosphere like you would do with fossil gas. But the difference is because we have been sourcing that CO2 to come from the atmosphere or come from biomass, it has no impact on the overall greenhouse gas balance. So those emissions, even though they still emit CO2, will be climate neutral. The preferred way is that if technically feasible, that we capture that CO2 and bring it back to the origin. And then it serves as a carrier to be fused again with fresh green hydrogen, turn again into ENG and bring that back to the customer. So thereby, we could even have a negative footprint if we start with biological or climate neutral CO2 and then put it in a circle. Yeah, indeed, we are a green hydrogen company. Um, the problem is that the places where you have affordable renewable electricity to produce the hydrogen in abundant quantity and the places where you need the energy are not the same. So we have to find a way to produce green hydrogen in places where solar, wind, hydropower are scalable and available at very, very affordable prices. And then we have to bring that hydrogen to those places where you need the energy. And hydrogen itself is very difficult to transport. It's the, it's the smallest molecule. It doesn't like to be trapped. So you either have very, very large volumes to transport, which is not feasible, or you have to liquefy to make it transportable where you lose over 30% of the energy. You still have a low efficiency. Uh, so that's why many people look into ways to transport hydrogen. And the only way to do that economically is to turn it into a different molecule to make it tight and transportable. And we've looked at all the different alternatives. And for us, electric natural gas, combining CO2 and hydrogen to make synthetic methane is the best way to transport and reach our customers through existing infrastructure and distribution systems. Yes, the Sabatier reaction is, is a very mature process. Paul Sabatier got a Nobel Prize in 1912, so over 100 years ago. So it's, it's a very well established and understood reaction mechanism. And you're right, from a mass balance perspective, and we get that question all the time, you take a CO2 molecule, you take four hydrogen molecules, and then you turn it into one methane molecule and two water molecules. So half of your hydrogen, indeed, if you look at the mass balance, half of your hydrogen goes into water. But we're talking about transporting energy. We're not talking about transporting mass of certain molecules. And on an energy level, it looks completely different. Um, if you look into the heating value of the hydrogen you invest, it's about 960 megajoules per, per reaction pass. So you put four of these molecules. And what you get out as the methane molecule is 800 megajoules. So you're recovering 83.3% of the lower heating value. And that's what really counts. So the energy we put in to produce the hydrogen is preserved with over 80% in that molecule that is so easy to transport and use. And the residual losses, energy is never destroyed. Energy is just converted. And so what is not going into the methane molecule the 83% that we preserve, the remaining 17% are rejected as very high temperature heat coming off your reactor. 
And of course, we don't let that go to waste. TESS is a company that cares about uh, sustainability. And so we are trying to use every little bit of energy and, and make the whole system as efficient as possible. So what we can easily do is take that high temperature waste heat and as a very simple example, turn it into steam and then put the steam through a steam turbine, thereby creating electricity that can then feed the electrolyzer again and reduce the amount of energy you need to put in. So thereby we can reach efficiencies that are even higher than the 83% you get off the shelf. And we have a credible pathway and technical solutions to bring that way above 90% efficiency. Yeah, why should we not just stick with fossil gas and capture the CO2? Well, first of all, if you look into the value chain of fossil natural gas, there's not only the emissions that happen at the end user where it's converted into CO2 and, and it's burned. Uh, unfortunately, a very large portion of the emissions and the, the greenhouse gas impact of natural gas comes from the upstream where you actually take the natural gas out of the ground, where you, tr where you clean it, you process it, you compress it, you make it transportable. So that really has a a significant impact and if we would continue just using natural gas and then capture the co2 those emissions would still stay and they are substantial uh, and then the other part is where do you want to put all that co2 because there is enormous amounts of, of lng transported around the world there's enormous amounts of natural gas used if you want to capture all that co2 it's going to be very energy intense and then you have to store that you will need huge volumes if you compare that to ENG, which is produced using climate neutral CO2, either circular or from biogenic or DEC sources, there you don't have any of these upstream emissions, which are, by the way, not only CO2, but also methane, which has a much higher potential for greenhouse gas uh, warming potential. If you stick to uh, ENG, then basically you're eliminating all those upstream emissions. And at the downstream, when the, uh, when the industrial user <clears throat> is converting that ENG in his process, any residual CO2 emissions will be climate neutral. So you don't have to sequester them, but best case, you still capture them. But then instead of having to bury them, you just bring them around in a circle to pick up fresh green hydrogen to make new synthetic ENG. Yeah. So, uh, Research and industry has been looking into different ways to transport hydrogen and different derivatives. And <clears throat> while TESS has chosen to focus on ENG, and I'll explain in a second why, uh, it's important to note that there's different use cases that will give uh, proper use to all these different derivatives. If you want to produce fertilizer, of course, going with ammonia is the way to go. If you have a ship that's running on liquid fuel, then E-methanol is the way to go. But if you look into the grand scheme of things, what really counts is the efficiency along the cycle, the existing infrastructure, how quickly can you reach your customer, and at the end of the day, also what is economically feasible. And we've studied all these different derivatives extensively. We've looked into what's the efficiency to produce them. And by the way, they're all pretty much on par. What is the availability of the technology to along the value chain? And can you produce that? Can you basically convert it back to hydrogen? And that's where things really start to deviate between the derivatives. The next thing is when you talk about transportation, what is the volumetric energy density? I know many people say hydrogen is such an energy dense molecule. It's true if you do it on a mass basis. On a volume basis, hydrogen is very, very poor energy density. It means in a certain volume, you don't get a lot of energy squeezed in. And that's important for transport. If we have to bring that green energy from a place where you have renewables available to a place where you need energy, the most important part is how much volume do I need to transport? And that's where ENG, electric natural gas, outperforms by, by a mile all these others. Compared to ammonia, for example, the volumetric energy density is about 1.7 times higher. That means to transport the same amount of energy to the destination, to the customer. With ammonia, you would need 1.7 ships where you need only one ship with, uh, with ENG. And the same holds for methanol and all the other derivatives. They simply need more space to be transported. And more importantly, the infrastructure for many of these is not existing to reach the final customer. So you also have a time delay, you have a huge investment needed. And that's why after carefully studying all these different derivatives, looking at the different technical readiness of the steps along the chain and the economics, we have chosen ENG.